no worries. <laughs> okay, well, that's true. Sorry about that, and I know the technical staff here who are assisting us are, are uh, probably troubleshooting right now. We're going to wait just a couple more minutes, but we are going to get started on time um, because uh, we have only one hour for this discussion. So thank you, everyone who's joined virtually and also the people who have just uh, filed in. And I'll get started in just one more minute. Uh, then I just had a request for our colleagues at the IGF to uh, change my name. I'm unable to do that myself, um, and I hope they will be able to do that. Okay, great. Technical team in our room? Uh, I'm going to go walk back there. Okay, be right back. Hi, we are going to check the audio again. Is this uh, better for you, Mira? It is. And Mira, I think you've also Much. been I think you've also been able to change your name yourself. So if you can go ahead and do that, that would be great. Great. Good morning, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. It is now uh, 9.30 here in Addis. My name is Daniel O'Malley. I am the Senior Digital Governance Specialist from the Center for International Media Assistance. Um, and it's my honor to be moderating this panel, Move Fast and Fix Policy. So oftentimes we hear from Silicon Valley, move, fa <laughs> move fast and break things. But here we want to move fast and fix things. Um, over the past year alone, 48 countries have proposed laws or new policy directives aimed at regulating social, economic, and political engagement online, according to research from Freedom House. This is everything from content moderation to data protection, disinformation laws, um, and it seems that change in the digital policy landscape is accelerating as governments and policymakers are compelled to develop and implement laws as quickly as possible as quickly as possible. We see this in the UN system as well with the focus on the, the Global Digital Compact, uh, the UN's, uh, UNESCO's regulatory framework. So there's a lot of interest even at the, the multilateral level on these issues. However, the rapid pace of change can pose challenges to robust multi-stakeholder engagement as that input becomes increasingly difficult for diverse stakeholder groups to provide meaningful input at the national, regional, and international level quickly. This is exacerbated by the growing range of digital policy proposals, as well as the fact that even small changes in one policy area can have ripple effects in other seemingly distant areas. You know, so I, uh, my uh, institute works on media development and uh, digital media sustainability, and we see changes to content moderation can have broad impacts on how media outlets work, for example. Now, moreover, the policy discussions that we are having are often dominated by two typically two stakeholders. Uh, you know, governments have a really big role in this, uh, particularly the, the active governments in this space, the US, EU, um, and then also big tech. Um, and so without broad-based multi-stakeholder engagement, there's a higher chance that new policies will be poorly conceived or in a worst case scenario, infringe upon internationally recognized human rights and also might just not accommodate the context in which these policies are, are eventually implemented. So the goal of today's panel is to first identify the problem and how it impacts different sectors, but then more importantly to think about uh, what success stories already exist and how we can Im improve an inclusive and democratic policy making process. Now this panel has been organized by the Open Internet for Democracy Initiative, which is a joint project co-organized by the Center for International Media Assistance, the National Democratic Institute, and the Center for International Private Enterprise. And the goal of this initiative is to foster a democratic engagement from all sectors of society in the digital governance process.
because at the end of the day, it's only through democratic digital governance that democracy will truly thrive in the digital age. Now, today's session is going to follow as such. Um, we're going to start with a moderated uh, conversation among our four esteemed panelists, who I will introduce momentarily. That conversation will last about 20, 25 minutes, and I've asked the panelists to keep their interventions brief um, so that it will be more like a dynamic conversation. And then we will open the floor to questions and comments from those of you in the audience on site and online. And my colleague Morgan Frost is our online moderator. So she will be moderating the Zoom chat and um, I'll be moderating the, the in-person audience here. And I want to thank the in-person audience here especially because this is the first session of the last day of the 2022 IGF. So you are the hardcore internet governance believers and um, I'm sure we'll have more people trickle in, but I, I think it's going to be a great conversation. I'm going to now briefly introduce our, our speakers. Mira Milosevic is the executive director at the Brussels-based Global Forum for Media Development. Before joining GFMD, she authored the World Press Trends Report, the most authoritative global source of data analysis on international newspaper industry. She managed the media development programs at Wanifra and served as the chief platform officer at Indie Voices and as director of Belgrade-based Media Center. Constance Deleuze, who I, I hope has joined uh, the call but may not have logged on yet, um, is the executive director at Project Liberty's McCourt Institute, uh, whose mission is to ensure that digital governance is prioritized in the development of new technology and embedded in the next generation of the web. She started her career at the, at the French Prime Minister's Service on Information Society Issues, and then she joined the Internet Society as Vice President of Institutional Relations and Empowerment. Constance, Constance has been instrumental in developing new internet governance institutions, notably uh, she was a part of the Internet Technical Advisory Committee to the OECD. In 2013, she was a second seconded to UNESCO to help develop their Internet Governance Strategy, um, which is the, the Rome Principles, Rights, Open, Accessible, and make Multi-Stakeholder, which I'm sure many of you are, are aware of. And she has served on a number of committees, including on the IGF's MAG. Catherine Muya is a lawyer who is currently leading the Digital Rights Department at Article 19 in Eastern Africa. Uh, in her current role, she leads the implementation of various projects aimed at promoting online free expression and an open internet. And previously, she served as the Digital Rights Lead at Lawyers Hub Kenya, where she supported national and regional stakeholders to develop and implement rights-respecting legislative frameworks. Uh, and she's, working, she's also worked, uh, helped written the data protection uh, laws and let policies in Kenya at the national and subnational levels and worked on digital safety and security and countering online violence. And last but not least is Paula Galvez, a Peruvian lawyer who has been navigating the intersection of law and technology for over 10 years. She is currently studying a Master of Public Policy at the University of Oxford as a Chevening Scholar. And recently, she served as a strategic advisor on digital regulation to the presidency of the Council of Ministers of Peru. And previously, she advised big tech companies on their public policy strategies in Peru. Uh, so a lot of experience there. And she has, uh, teach, uh, she has given classes at the University of Lima and coordinated uh, impactful initiatives as the head of audit and also has been engaged qu a lot in the U uh, at UN IGF youth observatory um, and the youth IGF movement. So those are our speakers and we're going to get it kicked off now and I'm going to throw um, our first question to Mira Milosevic. And I think one of the first things that we want to talk about is, you know, what do you see the challenge of this accelerating digital policy space, particularly from, from your sector? and also thinking about it from a regional perspective, if you like, as well. What are the, the, the challenges that are facing the news media sector in this accelerating digital policy space? Um, uh, good morning uh, from Scotland, and um, uh, thank you, Dan, and thank you, everyone, for joining us uh, this morning, uh, afternoon, night, uh, wherever you um, uh, are calling in uh, from. Um, just a, a bit of a background uh, on what the GFMD is, uh, is doing. Uh, we are a network uh, of more than 150 organizations in more than 50 countries around the world. And we are different organizations uh, from the perspective of internet governance. 
we have small fact-checking organizations, we have uh, policy organizations such as Article 19 here uh, with us today, and uh, we also have organizations that uh, uh, promote uh, uh, press freedom and uh, media development support to journalism all over the world, such as uh, investigative journalism networks. So we uh, have different uh, policy uh, interests and different also um, um, advocacy uh, targets and, and goals uh, within our own network. Uh, we are uh, seen as a neutral partner to all of our uh, both members, but also partners that we uh, cooperate uh, with uh, around advocacy and policy. And that gives us a, a really uh, a privileged um, uh, role in, in many processes. For instance, uh, in the European Union, we facilitate something called EU media advocacy uh, uh, group and exchange, where different uh, uh, advocacy organizations come together to exchange views. Uh, and this is very precious for us uh, over the last three years. Even organizations with uh, different uh, points of views have come together to discuss uh, major uh, policy and regulatory developments. We are also a secretariat for the Dynamic Coalition here at the IGF, uh, Dynamic Coalition for Sustainability of News and uh, Journalism. That also gives us uh, uh, a very uh, interesting view of different conversations around the world. And if I have to single uh, one of the challenges that uh, that we are, particular challenges that we are facing as a community gathered around freedom of expression, journalism, and media, it is that 20 years ago, uh, journalism and media had an established system of uh, sustainability. And uh, there was no need for, especially for uh, established uh, um, incumbents, so to say, media organizations, uh, to develop a strong policy around the world that will look at um, uh, whether they will exist in the future. I mean, we are now talking about the very existence of journalism online. And so uh, what we are facing is, is almost a, a huge gap in capacity knowledge tradition of developing a, um, a this kind of challenging uh, and uh, and large policy and regulatory piece that we are seeing today uh, all around the world. So we are seeing, uh, you know, lack of experience, lack of evidence, lack of research, uh, lack of um, understanding implications, as you were saying, of, uh, of different uh, policy pieces and decisions. Uh, on the other hand, we already have some uh, very interesting um, uh, example and successes around how collective oh. action is contributing to good policy, and I Great. can talk about that. Um, yes, we'll get to that uh, in, in the, the second next. question. Yes, yes, perfect. No, and I think that's a really interesting and good point from the media sector, right? You know, we're in a situation where some of these global conversations before the internet. You didn't have to engage in that. Um, and so this is a new space for many of the sectors, and this is, uh, means that we have to build our muscles and our capacities in learning about what mechanisms exist. I want to now turn to uh, Catherine Muya from Article 19 in Kenya. And could you, you know, answer the same question in terms of, you know, I know you've worked a lot on uh, data privacy and protection, the policy space in Eastern Africa. Um, what, what's your perspective of this accelerating digital policy environment and the challenges um, faced um, from from your your legal perspective and your from your regional perspective. So I'm going to start with an example that happened to me this week. So this week I was um, we're conducting research around journalistic exemptions with the Data Protection Act, which is basically the fact that our Data Protection Act allows the Commission to um, set up guidelines that would guide the media industry on how to how to navigate that act. And so we we were speaking to a group of journalists just to understand their knowledge and interpretation of this act. And I think we were speaking to some of the senior editors in media houses in Kenya, and their, their perspective was that, so this act is good for the data subjects, it's good for everyday users, but it's really like cumbersome for an editor because then it includes or it creates a level of compliance that they have to deal with every time they're passing a story or things like that. And there were examples of things that had erroneously gone on print. Recently, somebody was um, in an obituary where they weren't supposed to be. And so for them, it's like, 
it's a, an added layer of compliance that they don't know or they don't have an idea of. I think um, because many regulations are coming up within the digital space, sometimes it might be difficult for media practitioners to actually keep up with those legislations and to actually be continuously aware of the contents of this legislation, which then now makes it very difficult to conduct their work. But it also may or may not enhance like uh, a good environment for media practice and a good environment for um, free expression in this sense. So for example, a lot of um, a lot of the Eastern African countries right now have cybercrime legislations, and this um, legislation is always created with the intent of, you know, um, um, curbing offenses and mostly involve offenses of speech. So we've seen and we've documented a lot of the use of this legislation to restrict what press can print. So for example, around COVID, there was regulations around um, statistics that you could print for COVID or COVID cases, that which sometimes are used to restrict what media personalities or media entities in this sense can print. And then also there's the criminalization of publications so with the offenses it becomes very difficult that you might actually print something and it becomes like a liability for yourself, especially because in the media um, space, you might have people who are within an institution and freelancers. And so what we've come to understand is that the freelance media practitioners in this sense are more vulnerable than other people who have to go through editors and, and like institutional based approvals. So I think in this sense, um, the point I'm trying to make here is that it the the many different legislations that come up create layers of compliance that might not necessarily be known to media practitioners. Great, thank you, Catherine. And I think that's it's really good to bring a concrete example of what this means. Where and I think this we see this a lot with cyber crimes, which are often developed from certain sectors of government, but not thinking about other sectors of society. Which is just another example of why multi-stakeholder. Um, discussions and inclusion of different voices is important in developing this policy. Um, I want to now turn to, to Paola. Um, with your perspective, you know, you have been in a number of different seats working as a strategic advisor to the government of Peru, also working with, uh, I believe, financial institutions prior to that in Peru that worked in the digital space and now as an academic. So, uh, you know, from these different vantage points, how do you see this current environment and what is this environment, uh, how, is it ta how are things taking shape, particularly in the Latin American context? Sure. Um, first of all, good morning, good afternoon, good night to everyone that are joining this conversation. Definitely insightful topic that we need to discuss. Uh, and thank you for the invitation to the organizers of this um, session. Definitely, Dan, um, all the bills that we have been discussing, and actually, yes, I studied in this world when I was working in Microsoft um, 10 years ago, um, they are very different. And I can see the approach of the government. And even in the Congress, uh, it's different. Um, unfortunately, I cannot say that the teams involved in preparing these drafts in working or on the regulation um, have more knowledge on the um, digital ecosystem and how it works and how they are embracing multi-stakeholderism. Unfortunately, I don't see that yet. And I, I can even speak because I've been working in the Peruvian government uh, until September this year, and it's difficult to change the cultural mindset um, when they consider that the government has the only view, even though these topics are so new and they're evolving so fast, right? As the name of this um, session says, we need to move fast, but it doesn't mean that we need to do it on our own when we're speaking from the government perspective. And even when I was working for um, the private sector in, in a law firm, I could say there were intentions to bring to the conversation civil society universities, um, but there was not enough. Uh, and, and actually, I, I now that I'm in the University of Oxford with, with more time to actually reflect on what I've done, um, there are uh, something that I would improve, right? Right, which means uh, 
we <clears throat> I think we may have a challenge with Paula's audio. Are we connected with the other Zoom speakers? Yeah, okay. Okay, yes. unfortunately, <laughs> Paula uh, was cut off there. Uh, but I think that was an interesting point about her experience even over the past 10 years. You know, we've seen a lot of advancements in the discussions around uh, digital governance, but it sounds like the cultural shift within governments, at least in, in Latin America, has been slower than than some would like. Then, then Paula is back. Oh, Paula is back. Okay, sorry, Paula. L um, I'm so sorry. No, go ahead. Even in the UK, even in the UK, we have these problems uh, with connectivity. I will wrap up uh, briefly then so we can move on. Um, what I was trying to say is, I reflect that building trust and having meaningful relations with all the stakeholders and try to to build a, or map a stakeholders in an unbiased um, way is key. And I didn't realize that first. So uh, when we try to approach stakeholders or, or try to build um, work on roundtables, workshops, um, that's very practical. But first, we need to do a step backwards and say, okay, how am I building trust with my stakeholders? And in parallel, how to look in new stakeholders or at the underrepresented ones. Because for instance, in my case, I would always invite to all the typical NGOs, but there are more and actually Oh, I think unfortunately we've had another disconnection with Paolo. So I think uh, just- Yeah, I will connect from my phone. I'm really sorry. Okay, yeah, try joining again and we'll continue and um, uh, we'll get back to you. You'll be able to make your point. Um, I'm now gonna turn to Constance, who I'm really glad has, has now joined our uh, Zoom session. And you know, the question that we're talking about right now is just kind of understanding uh, the challenge in the in the current scenario of the accelerated kind of digital policy space and Constance, you know, you have one of the most y your resume is really uh, impressive in terms of developing different m monitoring and mechanisms tools and engagement tools. And I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about your perspective now at the McCourt Institute uh, about what you see as the challenge in this space. And um, yeah, thank you. Well, thank you and uh, apologies for joining a little late. I had a few technical uh, glitches to, uh, to address. Um, so from, from my perspective and, you know, uh, coming from, um, I started my career working for the, the French government and then spent um, uh, some time at the Internet Society working on multi-stakeholder policy processes. I also worked at, at UNESCO and, and now I've just joined at least uh, um, I've just joined the Matt Court Institute. Uh, what, what I have been able to uh, observe is that the key ingredient, and I think Paula uh, mentioned it, is trust. Uh, the difficulty for the different stakeholders in charge of developing uh, policies, whether they are from the public sector, whether they are from the private sector, um, is that either uh, they're going to face the difficulty on the government side uh, to fully understand to be exactly at the same speed, pace uh, than those developing technologies. Uh, the challenge for industry is to be able to convey the idea that they are absolutely impartial in proposing uh, policy regulations or policy frameworks. Um, and hence, uh, the conclusion I would reach is that it's important to have structures out there who are perfectly inclusive when it comes to uh, having representatives from civil society, consumers associations, youth, uh, academia, but also, and Paula mentioned this, the importance of having representatives from maybe other countries than the usual suspects, uh, countries who um, uh, have uh, individuals who might be uh, you know, the next leaders of, of SMEs in specific uh, tech, uh, tech markets and, and so on and so forth. The importance of offering impartial platforms that are scientifically uh, backed up so they're able to produce uh, rigorous work um, and who uh, therefore are able to offer a forum that is uh, providing trust and comfort to all stakeholders who can come together. 
The Internet Governance Forum is an excellent uh, example. It's under the auspices of the United Nations, but the decision-making process is full, fully multi-stakeholder. It's open, it's bottom-up, it's, uh, it's uh, grassroots, and it has um, technical industry policy leaders at the table. And I think that's why it's very interesting to see the development of these best practice forums, um, recommendations that are progressively coming out of the Internet Governance Forum. At the MacCourt Institute, uh, which is still a quite new organization, this is our goal. It is to work in partnership uh, with academia. Um, we have founding partners Sciences Po in Paris and Georgetown University in the U.S., and we will be expanding progressively uh, the uh, set of academic partners we would like to work with. And based on the findings of this um, uh, actionable research, practical research that we are supporting, our goal is going to be to engage a wide set, a multi-stakeholder community to uh, reflect on tomorrow's uh, policy, but also technical governance uh, when it comes to Web3. So I, I, you know, to, to, to wrap up, um, I think the, the key ingredient is obviously, obviously going to be trust. And it's important to uh, participate, to, to support, to create some impartial platforms such as the Internet Governance Forum, such as the MacCourt Institute that we are building in partnership um, and uh, under the auspices of a broader project called Project uh, Liberty. But there are other multi-stakeholder platforms out there. And uh, I actually think um, I will challenge a little bit what, what you said, Paola, because I, I come from the, the government side at the very beginning of my career. The culture is evolving. Um, the public sector uh, leaders are now fully uh, aware of the necessity to include industry, civil society um, at the table to be able to produce effective policies but also policies that are going to be legitimate. And the OECD is a good example. They created a permanent seat for the technical and academic, academic community. The internet governance is another example. We're seeing uh, progressively uh, governmental structures. It's, I think, in a law in Brazil that there needs to be a multi-stakeholder council for internet issues. Um, we're seeing these public structures open up in a more systematic way to multi-stakeholder input. And we're also seeing on the industry side, um, a, a higher uh, level of awareness on the need to fully include consumers, policymakers in uh, whatever technologies and, and governance mechanisms they're, they're developing. Great, thank you, Constance. And that's a really interesting, you know, some uh, interesting perspectives on, on, on how governments are or not evolving. That's really interesting. I, I want to now turn to Catherine Muya on the same topic of, um, you know, six, you know, maybe we call them success stories or examples of uh, inclusionary processes with, with sectors that are not, that have more challenges in being engaged. I know that, Catherine, you've uh, been involved with like private sector bodies like the, pri the Kenya Private Sector Alliance, the Technology Service Provider uh, of Kenya organization. And I'm, so, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about uh, your experiences recently there and also, you know, your take on this question of how governments and how different stakeholders are evolving in this space. Thank you, Dan. So um, I, I wanted to give an example of this private sector bodies and how they engage in policymaking, whereas underrepresented groups such as civil society and other represented groups have um, engaged with different regulators. So in Kenya, we have um, CAPSA, which is the Kenyan Private Sector Alliance, and TESPOC, which is an alliance of telecommunication providers, so ISPs and telcos. And um, my my comparison was how easy it is for these groups um, to access mostly regulators, to access members of the executive, and to present their own policy positions, and also how seriously government takes these policy positions when they are presented. So if you if you have a bill, and you have contributions, let's say from civil society and you have contributions from private sector, the, the overall 
um, reception from government is different. And I think mostly it's also because of trust, but it's also because of, I don't know, maybe economic value that the government feels that, um, you know, maybe we should like really look at this so that when capsule raises an issue, then the government takes it a little bit more seriously than if civil society raises an issue. But there are instances where we've seen um, private sector bodies working together with civil society to present certain things. So on issues such as data protection, um, to, on issues such as the cross-cutting issues such as copyright um, legislation. And you see certain successes when these two people come together and they're sharing different industry points. The idea here is then how can, what can civil society also learn from different um, bodies like EPSA? And for me, it was the need for collaboration even amongst different stakeholder groups and also within a stakeholder group. Because CAPSA is a private umbrella body, but um, civil society also sometimes achieve a lot of results when they come together. And we've seen certain results. Um, so for example, in legislation or you know challenging legislation such as the Huduma Bill in Kenya and really just engaging the government and getting the government to listen because they all work together as stakeholders and, and more or less exploiting their different strengths, exploiting the different strengths of different organizations. But also I wanted to say the involvement of communities also sometimes gets legislators to listen. So, and what I mean is, so earlier this year, I, I was appearing in parliament and it was about the copyright bill in Kenya. There was a proposed amendment that would have um, watered down provisions on intermediary liability, but then there was also provisions around revenue sharing for artists and something that we call like schizotin. It's a Kenyan thing where when somebody's calling you, the a song plays. And so there's like a the revenue share between the artist whose song is playing and the telecommunication company. And so what I noticed um, that really moved legislators is the fact that these artists came together and they were able to demonstrate to the legislators how this legislation was affecting them. And because there were the particular community that was being affected by this legislation, they were able to really move parliament to the part that that amendment was really passed with very minimal objections. So what I learned from this is that even as you, uh, even as your members of a certain group doing certain work, it's also really important to bring the particular stakeholders who might be underrepresented, who do not have that capacity, but just bring them in to sort of voice their um, their own concerns about certain legislations, which obviously sometimes leads to better results. So those were a little bit of my takes on that. Great, thank you, Catherine. And I'm gonna turn to next to, to Mira, but I just wanna remind the audience that we're gonna opening up for questions. So both audience on, uh, on site here in Addis, as well as our participants online, please uh, start to write your questions. Uh, Mira, so I know um, you, you know you you are already interested in telling us about some success stories. I thought the example that Catherine just mentioned was really interesting. Uh, it does seem like it's you know once something's happened, you know you can bring a community that's been affected and 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 advocate for change. But you know I think one of the things we also need to think about is how do we proactively think about these to mitigate <laughs> even if they're minor challenges in advance. And I think about you know the work that you and I have done on media is a lot of these things. Once they're in place, they're kind of hard to undo, even if they're a very sympathetic uh, community in terms of the community that's uh, producing high quality journalism. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about some of the success stories and lessons learned from your experience uh, working in this digital governance space. Yes, thank you, Dan, and uh, thank you to to my uh, uh, colleagues who have uh, mentioned some really important points. And there's a there is a lot uh, uh, to unpack. Um, just a linking to to something that was said around, you know, mapping and looking who's out there and those kind of uh, uh, coalitions of uh, civil society or other uh, types of stakeholders that come together in certain situations. So one of the big learnings that we've uh, had over the uh, the last couple of years, especially with the uh, EU uh, media advocacy group, that it's very important to to create a space uh, for different stakeholders uh, to come together on a permanent basis. So it's not enough to come together when something happens and just do it last minute. Um, and so having this space that gathers uh, around different uh, uh, subjects uh, and uh, creates this trust over time, if 
different between stakeholders that have different opinions. So what are we facing? For instance, we had a, a successful example of uh, uh, ads uh, uh, tracking, uh, um, anti-ads tracking coalition in Europe. And uh, it was successful in terms of uh, uh, managing to, to get their policy uh, attitudes e uh, into the Digital Services Act. And uh, uh, Europe is the first region where uh, tracking uh, uh, will be limited. Uh, and there are areas, especially around the minors, where this is going to be uh, implemented uh, almost fully. But at the same time, there are uh, media organizations that were against this. Uh, thinking that this will limit their ability to uh, um, uh, to earn money. And so it was very important to have a space where you understand media associations that came together and said, you know, we, this is the argument that we have. Now we have a similar situation around the European Media Freedom Act that, that is being drafted in Europe. And it's really important for us to have a space where different organizations like digital rights organizations come and say, well, we see this as a media exemption, as a potential backdoor for misinformation to come in. And then big media associations are coming and saying, well, this is the first time that press will have statutory regulation in Europe. Uh, and this can be a dangerous precedent for uh, non uh, governments that are not friendly to journalism and media to establish regulation over the press that traditionally in Europe was always self-regulated. So there are so many nuances and details, even within the smallest pieces of regulation that are coming in. And we need to understand that having these space this is first to have different uh, stakeholders with different opinions where they can safely uh, and uh, with confidence discuss these issues. Very important. This takes time, resources, energy, uh, and uh, persistence. Then the second thing is to map and know where these expertise live regionally. And so if you come from other region to know that, you know, they had, there is fantastic uh, case coalition, a coalition against uh, uh, slaps in Europe that also so can give, for instance, different uh, um, different experiences to our colleagues around the world. Uh, then and then finally, of course, uh, for all these multi-stakeholder processes, not only to open the space to uh, civil society, but to empower it to uh, give it resources and also to understand that a civil society as well comes with different shapes and colors and traditions and that we need to listen to all these voices to be able to uh, to create a policy and eventually some pieces of re uh, regulation that work both for users, both for uh, media and uh, uh, journalists and other parts of, of our societies. Great, thank you, Mira. And you know, I just want to, uh, you know, you made a really excellent point about even within one stakeholder group, for example, the media associations, there can be differences of opinion. And I want to put in a plug for the Dynamic Coalition for the Sustainability of News and Journalism because we are that is one of the permanent uh, places. It's an IGF working group where we discuss these issues and, and different media organizations, as Mira is well aware, have different perspectives about what needs to be done in the digital space, but it's really important for us to engage in those conversations. So if anyone online or in the audience is interested in learning more, you can approach me. I'm one of the co-coordinators of that uh, DC. Um, I want to come now to, uh, to Paula. Um, and I know you have a lot of experience working um, uh, from from a government angle, working with civil society, and that you have you have ideas about you know, like what works and how to build trust. But one of the things that I've also heard, and I I'd like your reaction to this from parliamentarians, is that oftentimes they feel like civil society comes to them with a package or a thing that they want, and it becomes hard for parliamentarians uh, or policymakers to want to do that because they feel like they haven't been involved in the process. So as much as we oftentimes hear that civil society is excluded, which is, which is the case many times, I've also heard it from the other side of the coin uh, that uh, parliamentarians feel like they just have to rubber stamp whatever civil society brings them. You have a, a unique position there to think about that. So I'm wondering about uh, you know, your, your experiences on um, what works and then also on, on that question of, um, because it's really important that we, we work with uh, like-minded human rights respecting uh, parliamentarians and governments? Definitely. Uh, thank you for the question. Actually, in Peru, we've had the most proposals from the Congress rather than the executive branch where, where I was serving. Um, but it was my... Uh, 
task to discuss with the congressman and their team how to better improve these proposals. And I, I didn't have this reaction, to be completely honest. Um, however, they would like their proposal to be as it was drafted. However, the multi-stakeholder reason they understood it was important. And actually, the digital transformation system in Peru uh, is approved by a law that establishes that these conversations, uh, sorry, that the approval of these re regulations must be done under a multi-stakeholder approach. So following the, the law, we would always make roundtables, um, but it was done under a neutral actor. And actually, this is what uh, Constance mentioned. In Peru, what we did was uh, held these um, meetings in a university. So academia was um, the host of the meeting to discuss uh, some proposals. And when I was discussing with several civil society uh, NGOs, they would say that they felt more comfortable in that um, in that uh, place rather than in going to Congress, because it would imply that uh, for them sometimes they were looking for a specific opinions, but not what really the NGO could uh, afford, could, could um, complement to the, to the regulation. So actually it worked very well. Um, however, to bring more NGOs, or even the, the small ones, I remember once I wanted to have the voice of LGBTQ uh, plus community, which were not always included, um, it was better to call them through a big civil society organization that had already established a, a bill, a trust with them. So the big NGO was the one that called a small civil societies. Also for having uh, SMEs in the table, which for me was very important, I would call the uh, it's called the Peruvian SMEs Association, and they would call to other small uh, chambers because it's, it's, it's a matter of trust. In, in, in Actually, it's, that's how I would assume it. How can I summarize that? If you build the relationship, relationship engagement with them, they will come and they will share um, their insights. Um, I would say that most of the bills in Peru uh, didn't, were, were not approved because um, the, the crisis in Peru may sometimes that these bills take a lot of process and then it's, it changes um, the, the, the congressional um, term. But um, these, this, these discussions also help for the next bills to be presented. Um, that's, that's my two cents, Dan, on, on this topic. Great, great. Thank you, Paolo. That's really interesting. I also th think that that's interesting about that point. I never thought about, you know, how you can have larger, more well-established um, civil society organizations reach out to the lesser established. So it's that's a part of a, a, a process, you know, um, and that could be addressed. I want to now turn to Constance, um, you know, because you have so much experience building these kind of neutral mechanisms. Uh, and I was wondering, we have talked a number of uh, situations about Europe, and I was wondering um, uh, what type of uh, success stories you've seen in other regions in this regard, and um, what other points maybe in addition to the points that uh, our other panelists have talked about, you know, you academies, neutral mechanisms, permanent engagement, what other um, things might you add to the list in terms of moving fast and fixing policy? And then we'll be uh, turning well, to thank questions. You, thank, you for the, thank you for the question. Um, I was very intrigued to see over the years that uh, some of these open multi-stakeholder processes actually were put in place in countries where the digital economy was not necessarily uh, the most rapidly developed. I mentioned uh, Brazil previously. We've had the example of, of Kenya. Uh, so just to point to the fact that you have um, very inspiring examples of agile and inclusive mechanisms who stem from different places in the world. And um, it's, it's sometimes a good, you know, good source of inspiration, I think, and a good uh, example setting for some of the most developed uh, digital economies of, uh, of the world. Um, the second aspect is, um, I think, the cultural change that we've been talking about, I'm convinced it's, it's in motion. Uh, and I've, I've seen it because 
20 years ago, um, you know, laws were not developed in a systematically open multi-stakeholder uh, fashion. Um, there were no um, uh, institutionalized channels for civil society to come and share concerns, thoughts, uh, for industry to come in in a, in a systematic way. Um, and now these uh, platforms, these channels, these, uh, these fora are um, multiplying, whether it's at the national or international level. And I think that's very good. And I think it's ongoing effort. It's, uh, it's something we're going to have to continue nurturing, asking for uh, improving. One, um, one aspect I would highlight and that I, I don't think uh, was mentioned yet is that it's not enough to simply open channels of communication to have uh, good policies, good governance mechanisms, good, good technical governance uh, stemming either from um, industry or, uh, or governments. Uh, it's very important for the different stakeholders to actually be educated, to be equipped with the knowledge that's going to be necessary to fully understand what's at stake. Um, and in this regard, uh, the, the, the different platforms, impartial that we've been talking about, Internet Governance Forum, Macport Institute that we're building today with Project Liberty, but there are others out there, Internet Society um, that has uh, done a tremendous work over the, the, the past 20, 25 years. Um, in addition to that, I think these organizations in parallel to facilitating inclusive processes, uh, asking for open channels, um, highlighting the importance of multi-stakeholder dialogues for uh, technically and scientifically uh, grounded regulations, it's important that we also concentrate some of our efforts and resources in um, uh, empowering people very concretely through e-learning programs, through fellowships, through briefing sessions with uh, parliamentarians, any action that can equip uh, from a knowledge point of view, those who need to make decisions tomorrow, I think is gonna be equally important in an impartial way, of course, is gonna be equally important to, to opening from an institutional point of view, uh, the possibility that channels for different stakeholders to, to contribute. Otherwise, all of our multi-stakeholder processes are going to be simply cosmetic. So for me, it's very important to advance on both fronts, empowering individuals. Um, and, you know, we could also talk about how to reform educational uh, systems for, for, for youth. That's equally important than actually equipping uh, policymakers or parliamentarians. Um, and in parallel, of course, continuing to open up these multi-stakeholder channels. Great, thank you, Constance. And you know, I mean, I'm, I'm glad that you're seeing positive movement in this space, and, and and I fully agree with you that we need to make sure the stakeholders aren't just present, but also informed and being able to engage. Especially as there are more of these processes out there, it can also be a lot of time and energy, and so we need to dedicate resources and capacities to that. We now have, uh, I know, one question from the uh, from the online chat, but I was wondering if anyone in the room has a question. We have one question here. So we'll go ahead, uh, and Morgan, are you going to read the, the question from the chat? And then we'll uh, take the question from the audience. Sure. Thank you, Dan. We have one question from Guy Berger. He is also microblogging the Great Discussion. Thank you, Guy. And he has provided his information in the chat where he is doing that. So I encourage everyone to take a look. His question is the contrary view to shaping policy catch up to tech industry development is that policy can incentivize and enable this development with requirements like risk assessments, safety by design, transparency, and resourcing. In other words, policy that is by def definition behind, but sets the guardrails at the same time. So if you have any comments around that, Guy is really interested in learning your thoughts. Thanks. Thank you. And we'll go to this question, and then we'll throw that to our panelists. Hi, Helani Galpai from Learn Asia. Um, policy is about in the initial making of the policy, whether it's reactive or catching up with what's going on. 
But I think another role is also the feedback loop when things are not working. So I think both are part of the policy making process. And we rarely pay attention to that course correction and the feedback loop. And there's real opportunities, I think, for multi-stakeholder engagement. That's just a comment. The question really, I mean, I came to this session because it was nicely titled Move Fast, Fix Fol Policy. So there's been a lot of nice stuff about the process of engagement, but what is the answer to speed, actually? We do need to get that done fast, and I personally don't know of one. I mean, we work in policy windows, and the only solution is to have built up a long-term cadre of people you know, at international level, local level, who can engage when a sudden policy window opens up. So there's a speed element there. Um, and to having done the research so that you, you have your guns lined up when the window opens and you go. That's civil society, that's trained people, that's government with capacity, the networks to connect, you know, all of that. So that's certainly one part of the solution, but how do we address the issue of speed? I really haven't heard anything about speed uh, from the panel. Thank you. Great, thank you for the, both of those questions. We're gonna take those, and I wanna see, um, uh, who on our panel uh, would want to address that, the question from Guy about how do we th build things that aren't just the guide rails once things go wrong, this I intervention about the feedback loop, as well as speed, which is important. Um, how do we address that? Any takers from the panel? Mira? Yes, um, uh, thank you, Guy. And I haven't uh, uh, called the name of uh, our colleague from uh, Learn Asia. Uh, Helani uh, Galpai. That's Galpai. Thank you for for the question. I think uh, uh, excellent one, uh, and I think they're connected actually. Uh, so uh, to 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 guys' uh, question in terms of um, catching up, uh, I I think that we are not only catching up, but we are participating in in policy and regulatory framework that I think is mostly set up by the big companies. What do I mean is uh, the, all these conversations and what we are putting in motion are not fundamentally challenging the systems and architecture uh, and also the business model of the platforms in place. Uh, and so there are bits and pieces that are that are being being done. And so um, in terms of risk assessments, I think they're crucial and safety by design, of course. But then when it comes to transparency, um, it's also very important to look behind the transparency reports and what is meaningful transparency for different groups. For instance, in terms of journalism and media, transparency that we are getting from platforms at the moment is not meaningful because we can't disaggregate transparency reports around certain groups. And then you will have our colleagues from uh, online coalition against uh, online violence uh, um, um, towards women journalists that were uh, also talking here at the IGF, looking at how this particular group is severely affected online, but there is no meaningful transparency for, from platforms uh, to address this. There are no mechanisms to, to act quickly and fast, as the colleague is saying. So uh, I don't think it's a question only of speed. It's a question of scale. And uh, uh, having space not only to have these nitty gritty discussions, but having big questions posed and big discussions uh, had. So I think the big question that is coming up in the conversations at the moment is how do we address the, the question of content moderation and regulating platforms at scale and not in a, at case by case basis. And there are two articles that I really like at the moment. One is from um, Evelyn Dweck, um, and I'll post the link called Content Moderation as Systems Thinking. And I think that this is the framework that actually we have an opportunity to set. And the other is from um, a scholar uh, at the uh, uh, LSE, Martin Husovitz, who talks about trusted content creators. So this is something that I think uh, if we change the approach and look at regulation at scale and not case by case basis, which we did uh, um, normally in the freedom of expression space, I think we can also then think about speed because then it will be addressing a lot of issues uh, at the source 
uh, by design, as Guy is saying, uh, and uh, that would that will give us uh, give us speed. But for the, all of this to happen, we need all those things that uh, my colleagues have mentioned. You know, mapping, cooperation, education, investment, resourcing, and having all these groups of stakeholders ready to act. Great, thanks, Mira. I'm, Constance, I want to come to you about this. You know, about what Guy's question, and also this question about speed. Yeah, obviously, we understand, you know, we need to build up capacity, and you spoke about capacity, but how do we do that at speed, especially with communities that may not have had the same amount of uh, expertise in this area and are, are still developing that expertise? Well, I, I would say it's really a question of resources. Uh, like many things, it comes down to investment and time and, and, and financial resources. Uh, organizations like the Macquarie Institute, but also um, I've seen this at, at the IGF or around Diplo Foundation, uh, have been training uh, hundreds, thousands of individuals, whether students, policymakers, industry leaders who actually uh, design policy uh, through technology. Um, and this is something that uh, needs to continue, but to to address the question about speed, um, and this is, you know, the 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 example that my colleague was just describing, it's post-regulation. It's it's actually about okay. Once we have regulation, are, do we have the right um, transparency guarantees, uh, mechanisms in place to verify that platforms, different players, industry, but also beyond are complying with law. And um, can users who are not necessarily uh, educated from a tech perspective or even a, a regulatory perspective, do, have, do they have a mechanism? Do they have a, an impartial party to go to for help, assistance, and verifying that the way they've utilized uh, a service or consumed information through a platform or interacted with some sort of digital uh, digital service, um, is it uh, compliant with law? And here, uh, I think it's going to uh, take a bit more time and probably additional resources to equip the ecosystem with those uh, impartial third parties, go to people who can uh, be a resource to uh, consumers, internet users, uh, and who can also um, provide a channel uh, of trust for these different individuals. Um, and that, from my perspective, we've seen some attempts, but from my perspective, it's probably going to be one of the um, uh, next priorities for the different uh, players in, in this field. And the nonprofit sector will have a role to play, uh, academia, uh, impartial organizations, uh, civil society is going to be key in that conversation to back up internet users and ensure that we actually co-create, co-design a space where uh, not only regulation is developed in a multi-stakeholder fashion, technology is ethical by design, but also I would say in a post uh, phase, in a phase two, uh, compliance, uh, accountability is also equally uh, trustworthy. Great, uh, thank you. We're gonna add one more question. We have one more question in the audience and then I'm gonna pass it to uh, Catherine and then um, Paula to, to respond to all three. Uh, uh, thanks. Uh, uh, so it was mentioned that uh, how Excuse me, could you please uh, introduce yourself, name? Yeah, sure, uh, so my name is Masai and I'm from Center for International Private Enterprise, uh, Ethiopia. <laughs> uh, so like, uh, it was, was, was mentioned uh, that the how governments are evolving, uh, but in my opinion, uh, like it depends on from uh, where and uh, which angle uh, we are looking at. Uh, like for example, like in Ethiopia, uh, there are v uh, visible and commendable uh, change, like openness from the government side to sit and discuss with the with the private sector, uh, civil society organization when it comes to uh, policies and stuff. But uh, the problem is like when it comes to you know, uh, changing or putting policy into action, uh, there, are, there are huge gaps. So, uh, so my question like, uh, goes to all the panelists. Uh, what, what do you advise? Like in strategies you now you can share like the private sector, uh, the civil societies 
should should follow it to push uh, government to put their words into into the immediate action. Thanks. Great. Thank you. And we unfortunately we're running out of time, so I'm going to pass this to um, Catherine and then uh, Paola to answer th these three questions and try, try to be brief, be brief as we only have a couple more minutes here in the conference room. Okay, um, I was going to give an example of the speed question, mostly because um, I've seen it work in our context. So one of the um, examples I would have given around speed is when the stakeholders are pushing for regulation as a, or and working together with regulators. So the example I have is, um, for example, in Kenya, we have regulation around community networks, not really related to media, but access to um, the internet. And how we came about to having this regulation is it was really like an industry supported push from civil society, working with others and um, learning across each other and then presenting it to the regulators and the regulators allowing the space for the development of these regulations. So really, it makes that policy making process really easy because it comes from um, industry and academia led research that's presented to the regulator who then says yes. But then the other point I wanted to make is cross-learning and cross-collaboration. So for example, Avrins gave um, a talk about our infrastructure regulations to the Namibia IGF and the Namibia Regulatory Authority, the Communications Regulatory Authority. And they were really keen on taking it up and pushing it because I presented all the advantages that we have um, from our own different regulations. So that's the way in which when you present evidence-based cases, and then it find, it further like it makes the policy making really quick and really Really fast. But then again, and so that goes also to the second question in terms of the implementation. Really, sometimes regulators want um, evidence case and like seeing how much you can benefit from this um, policy to push and drive the implementation. So I guess that those examples more or less answer the both questions. But then it also goes to promoting collaboration. And as my colleague said, multi stakeholderism just to push for these things and to push for the implementation. Great, thank you, Catherine. Paola. Thank you, Dan. I know we're running out of time, so I will be very brief. I believe there are three key things that we need to consider. First, and I'm addressing to policymakers to make this happen, right? To push uh, in a fast way uh, and to involve all the stakeholders, mostly underrepresented ones. First, that it, this uh, the advocacy and the process must be done and developed early enough uh, so we can scope the key issues and we have enough time to make the changes that may be conceived as necessary by the multi-stakeholder discussion. Also, that it must be informed. Um, in, they, they, have relevant, they must have relevant information. They must be disseminated in advance for the stakeholders so we can be respectful with their time and we can get their inputs in a, in a proper way. And third, they will be meaningful to those consulted. So we need uh, to consider what are the interests, what are the topics of expertise. So it must be presented in an understandable format <clears throat> and uh, avoid a specialized technical jargon. Uh, in terms of uh, the SMEs or civil society to be prepared because capacity building is so important, I, I would encourage uh, that they are always connected with universities, with academia, because uh, they're always open to share papers and uh, as Mira said, or share their always information online. But it's, it's important to contact people and ask for resources because uh, I've seen here in Oxford that they're always open to share. Uh, so in my case, uh, if you want to reach out to me and maybe I can connect you with someone here in the University of Oxford, I'm happy to do it. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Paola. And unfortunately, we've reached the end of our um, session. I know this could go a lot longer, but there are many other interesting sessions. I know uh, people online and in the room are going to need to rush off. Um, I really want to uh, you know, end with, we won't have concluding marks from our panelists, but I want to end with a couple key points that I think have come out. One, this idea that it's important to have neutral mechanisms and neutral spaces to have these multi-stakeholder uh, discussions so that I think in part to build trust because trust has emerged as one of the important things to do this. Uh, permanent engagement is important. We can't uh, just one-offs every here and there. It's not going to build trust either, and it isn't going to build enough of the knowledge and capacity that we need, especially if we want to do these things quickly. Uh, regional mapping of experts is important, and I think this is also not just regional, but also within your stakeholder group as there are diverse opinions. Civil society is diverse in itself, and so we need to have those discussions internally. Uh, there will be differences of opinion. 
Um, it's not enough to open channels of communication. Uh, you need to make sure that they're meaningful channels of uh, communication. And to do that, stakeholders need to be educated and fully informed. And I think one outstanding question is still the speed issue, which is a, a thing that uh, is challenging. We have some I ideas about that, but I think we're all going to learn how to address that because I think things are getting faster. And so we're going to uh, have to figure out how to make that happen. Um, I think it will be really important. Um, the digital governance space is increasingly important to our economies, societies, democracy worldwide. So it's really been a pleasure to have this panel, uh, have the speakers uh, talk with us because it gives me hope about the future and what we can do uh, to build it together as we build networks to improve the digital governance space. Um, so let's please give a round of applause to our speakers for their time and generosity with us. We should also give a round of applause to uh, the technical staff here in Addis who made this hybrid session possible and were troubleshooting throughout the session. Thank you so much for the hard work you've been doing for us. And thank you, uh, thank you to our captioner as well. Uh, it's really important that this is captured and it's inclusive. And also to my um, virtual moderator, Morgan Frost from the Center for International Private Enterprise who was making sure that everything that's captured in the chat was captured. Uh, in our conversation. And thank you to all of you for showing up from wherever you are joining around the world. Thank you. <laughs>